right. So thank you so much for being here. I am. All right, looks like I'm not, it's not gonna let me share my screen, which is fine. So what I'm gonna do is I just wanna tell you that I'm the executive director of Axis and I'm really excited to have you here tonight. I'm very excited to have this webinar. Wanna let you know the mission of Axis is to help individuals with one or more extra X and Y chromosomes and their families live full and more productive lives. And we did this through support, education, research, and treatment. You can visit us on genetic.org. We wanna tell you about the Access Clinical and Research Consortium. We now have clinics in 14 different cities and we've also added clinical researchers from NIH and some of the European clinics. And we have international clinics. We have a clinic in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, and we just added a clinic in Denmark with Dr. Klaus Grabholt, who many of you know. We hold in-person support groups and we will again, once it's safe. And we have online support groups. So please watch your email and look on our website and our Facebook groups to see when our support groups are held online. We have a helpline, which is helpline at genetic.org. We actually have an email number and a toll-free number where trained people respond to people's questions. We pair individuals with a peer. So someone who has a prenatal diagnosis, someone with a specific condition, we're very happy to try to um, do the best we can to offer support and answer your questions. And we do all of this free of charge. We have a series of brochures that are about the different X and Y conditions, and we're very happy to share this with you. Just shoot me an email, carolam at genetic.org, and I'm happy to send you as many brochures as you need. Please look on our website for our library, which have lots and lots of research articles, including the one we're going to talk about tonight that's in our library. And this webinar and all of our other webinars are we put on our, our YouTube channel. So check us out. Last thing I want to tell you is tomorrow, December 1st is Giving Tuesday, which is very important here in the US, which really kicks off the season of giving here. We have lots of ways that you can help support access financially. One thing you can do is you can text to 484-228-7139, and I'll put that in the chat. Text either give, right there, give or donate, and I'll send you a link to our um, annual fund. So we really appreciate any support that you can give us during this time. What I wanna do now is I wanna turn this over to Jordan Richardson from the Mayo Clinic. And we're super excited to hear this research because what Jordan did is she did a research project with our families. And she asked you the experts to talk about things and she did a survey that was published in the scientific research for everyone to see. And now she's here to present that back to us. So I feel like it's going full circle. So thank you so much, Jordan, for being here. And I hand it over to you. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen really quick. Um, okay, thumbs up, we can see it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, so um, as Carol mentioned, my name is Jordan Richardson. I work at the Mayo Clinic in the Biomedical Ethics Research Program. I am a post baccalaureate trainee, so that means I'm taking two years off between my undergraduate and hopefully medical school and doing research in biomedical ethics. And this is one of the research projects that I was really fortunate to be able to take part in while I'm here. Um, so this research is a little bit different than some other research that you would probably be familiar with, particularly with this community that's been involved in some of the more kind of medical research. This research is called qualitative. And the way that this works is that our research team and you know kind of all of us here in the biomedical ethics research program understand that compared to you guys compared to the families we know very little about what it's like to actually be a parent to a kid with a sex chromosome aneuploidy or to be somebody with a sex chromosome aneuploidy and we understand that really the knowledge base is you guys um, and very little of what i actually share today for our research results is going to be a surprise to many of you. Um, and so kind of the goal of this research of you know, qualitative research and ethics research generally is to look at families and the people who are the knowledge base, which is you guys, and to kind of systematically analyze and collect those stories and then put them out into the literature in a way that is helpful. So the way that this study specifically worked is I think about four or five years ago, um, there were a series of interviews, which some of you may remember, um, where our research team asked a variety of questions about 
what it was like to receive a diagnosis of an SCA or what it was like to go to these different appointments or to raise a kid or, you know, these are about 30, 45 minute interviews. And then what our research team did was we analyzed these interviews using a fairly rigorous process. And this process is called coding, but it's not kind of your typical computer coding. Uh, the way it works is we have all of these interviews, we put them into transcripts, and then two or three different researchers will read through every single one of these interviews multiple times and essentially go through with the software and tag all of these interviews with different themes that emerge. And then what we really come up with is basically a database of all of the knowledge that we gleaned from our families through these interviews. And then what the researcher does from there is using this database, we pull out some kind of core themes and then write those up, contextualize them a little bit in some of the kind of other research that's been done in this field, and then publish it in a journal where hopefully there are people who could benefit from this knowledge who will read it. So for this specific paper, I pulled out the themes of kind of parent advocacy and advocating in social systems and stigma and summarize them. And that's really the paper that I'll be discussing with you guys today. And it was published in the Journal of Developmental and Behavioral Pediatrics, which is a journal that a lot of developmental and behavioral pediatricians read. And so the idea is to, for the research team to really be kind of that intermediary or translator between the knowledge of the community and the knowledge of these families and really bring that to the attention of hopefully some people who it can make an impact for. So that's kind of the disclaimer. That's really the research methods that we're working with here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just get into really what we found through this process. Uh, so here's kind of the overview of the families. So we interviewed 32 total interviews where you'll see there are 34 participants. So there were kind of a couple where there were two in the interview. Um, and as you can see, we had a wide representation of different states across the US, a few international participants. And we also had a pretty good representation across kind of the different types of sex chromosome aneuploidies. Um, and so a lot of our results, interestingly enough, didn't necessarily cluster around, you know, trisomy X or Klein-Felters or anything like that. They really did seem to be kind of speaking for a lot of the community. However, some of them did seem to be like a little bit more, um, a little bit more advocacy was necessary with kind of the rarer of the tetrasomies, um, which probably isn't too surprising. So here's kind of our overall demographics. And here are really what our results were. So unsurprising to many of the people watching this webinar, we found that parents have to do a lot of advocating for their kids with sex chromosome aneuploidies. And we really split this up into kind of four main takeaways. Um, the first is that the parents start this process of advocating and working for their kids well before any actual kind of genetic diagnosis is reached. And even in medical situations or clinical situations, a lot of the time the parent often has to act as the expert and share information with their clinician about their child and share medical information even with their clinician. Um, we found that parents advocate for their children not only in kind of a medical space, but also in social services and education services and therapy and things like that. And we found, again, probably not surprising to many of you, that being an advocate can be incredibly overwhelming and burdensome, but it can also be really fulfilling. So with qualitative research, well, our main um, data is actually kind of quotes from people. And if you end up reading the paper, you'll see that a lot of it is kind of summary statements with some quotes that really help support it. And the reason we do this is because, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, really the most powerful voice in this field is the voice of the parent and is the voice of the community. And so when we use quotes, we really hope to kind of shine that and amplify that because that's where the truth is. Um, and so I'm just gonna go ahead and take you through some quotes that really illustrate kind of these four main points. So this first one is advocacy during the diagnostic um, odyssey. And what we found with these, and I won't read these quotes to you because um, 
nobody really wants that. But what we kind of found in summary is that a lot of times parents ended up having to go back to a clinician and go back to a clinician and ask for a referral and ask for a referral again and just keep pushing because they kind of had this sense or this intuition that there was something wrong or that there was something missing. And so they really ended up having to push. And in some cases, this was a multi-year process. In some cases, this was a multi-decade process. Um, but a lot of the times, this kind of role of being an advocate did start early and did start before somebody even really knew that their kid had a sex chromosome aneuploidy. Um, and then we also found that a lot of times the parents really acted as the medical experts, even when they were talking to doctors. And there were a lot of stories that families shared where parents would have, you know, entire binders of like all of the peer reviewed research about their kids specific tetrasomy or, you know, whatever it is and how they would have to bring that to their provider, to the whatever doctor they were seeing that day and basically explain to the doctor the medical information, um, which was really astounding to us because we kind of assumed that, especially when you're talking about, you know, endocrinologists, that they would have a better idea. And it turns out that the parents are the ones who are really doing a lot of this work, especially when the kids are young. Um, and so they are really kind of shouldering that burden of being like the medical expert for their child and just assuming that they're gonna be the one who has to kind of take control of that clinical encounter. Um, another huge thing that we found was that a lot of parents really had to fight to get their kid social services or education services that they needed. Um, this was particularly true um, in the United States. However, it was also true in kind of some of those international examples. And a lot of times parents would describe, you know, extended IEP meetings or having to get 18 different types of paperwork in order to make sure that their kid was getting each service that they needed um, and having to prove that their kid needed service or being taken on and off and that this could often even be a full-time job for some of the families that, I, that we spoke to. And last but not least, um, we found that this is hard and that this is an exhausting process and that it can be really challenging. And like I mentioned, I think a few slides ago that for a lot of families, this really does feel like a full-time job. And that another thing that we found really kind of throughout was how important groups like this are to a lot of families and how connecting with other parents, connecting with um, other professionals really helped to kind of ease some of that burden and build some community. Um, but overall, it is very difficult and is a very kind of hard thing to do to have to be an advocate in all of these different ways that we just talked about. Um, so those are kind of the main results and a lot of that or all of that really came from you guys and your stories. And so what I'm going to do over the next couple slides is kind of contextualize it a little bit and talk about it in relationship to some of the other research that we know exists um, in similar fields. So the first question we kind of ask is we see this thing that's happening, why is it happening? And there isn't really any one good answer. Um, there could be, you know, dozens of years of research studies to try to answer that question. Um, however, we do have a few kind of good ideas. Um, the first is just the fact that unfortunately a lot of sex or a lot of sex chromosome aneuploidies really are just a statistical rarity and that makes them harder to recall, if, even if you've only been exposed to them once or twice. Um, and that kind of helps explain part of the reason that a lot of medical providers aren't fully you know, informed or able to like have these conversations. Um, another reason that, and probably one of the biggest reasons that parents, particularly in the United States, end up doing a lot of the kind of advocacy and like direct care coordination work is because the way that healthcare and social services and education services all work together in the United States is essentially that they, they don't. Um, it's a very fragmented system. And 
each system has different agencies that coordinate it and different payers and some are public and some are private and go 10 miles across the straight line, the state line and it's an entirely different situation that you have to figure out. Um, and that basically puts all the onus on the parents to have to do that. And between all these different systems, there's very little communication, very little standardization. You know, you can get your doctor to write the note, but you're probably the one who's gonna have to email it to the right person and figure out who that person is. Um, and really it's that fragmentation that ends up kind of putting a lot of the burden on the parents. And a little bit of context is that this is a phenomenon that we do see with families with children with kind of different developmental disabilities or other rare diseases. However, kind of with these different patient populations, it is going to look a little different. And so that's why it's important to kind of do the research for each patient population because they're all so unique and they're going to have different needs and they're going to really need to be met by either social service or clinical providers in a different way. So even though this isn't probably surprising for a lot of people who are familiar with kids with developmental differences, um, it is still important to really kind of understand the difference between different patient populations. Um, so why is this all a problem? May seem like kind of an obvious answer, but sometimes you have to really kind of spell these things out. Um, the first is that it's really just kind of an unfair burden to parents. And I know I'm not a parent. And so for me to really say something's unfair, I know that so many parents in our study said that they would do anything for their child. Um, but just because you would do anything from your child doesn't mean that you should have to. And we've seen in other literature that parents who are doing all this advocating really do experience high rates of burnout and just a lot of exhaustion because they're acting, you know, not only as the parent, which is, I've heard already exhausting, um, but they're also acting as an expert and a care coordinator and, you know, all these other things. And that's just really kind of an unfair burden to parents. And then the second reason, it's a little bit more practical is that a vast majority of parents are not doctors, they're not medically trained, and they aren't carrying these kind of like impartial clinical perspectives about their children. Um, whenever you're, you know, describing a child to a doctor and at the same time describing like the medical aspect of a condition to a doctor, you're not really coming at that from a really, you know, impartial scientific way. You're coming at that as a parent who loves a child and who spends every single day with that child and sees that child in all of their kind of nuance and here and there. And there's, you know, a reason that there are separate roles for the parent and for the physician. And one of the reasons is because the physician should be medically trained and able to kind of interpret a child in the context of, you know, broader clinical standards. And that's just something that's really hard, if not impossible, for a parent who's raising that kid to do. Um, one of the reasons why, if you're a pediatrician, you probably wouldn't be your kid's pediatrician um, is because it's really important to have those separate barriers in order to kind of maintain that medical and clinical integrity. And last but not least, one of the big reasons that this is a problem is because whenever we see parents kind of taking on these massive roles, it actually does compound existing inequalities. Um, and this is a problem because it leads to very different outcomes for the kids um, and also different outcomes for the parents. And so what we found in our results as well as kind of in the broader literature is that this, this really does kind of have three main avenues. Um, the first is the ability to advocate. And so as um, talked about earlier, and I think I showed in some of the quotes, this is not like an easy thing. <laughs> this is, you know, manipulating an entire web of a bunch of different providers and payers and services and sometimes, you know, hammering your fist at the door and putting up meetings and all of these things. And those are incredibly hard to do if, for example, English isn't your first language or you're not able to take time off of work in order to do all of these things. Or um, there's been quite a few studies that have shown that people of lower income level or lower education level um, don't feel as empowered or as kind of justified in raising concerns to um, 
people that they perceive as authority figures. And so just that can act as a huge barrier in the ability of families to advocate or even knowing that they have a right to or they should advocate. Um, another thing we found is that it can be a huge financial strain. Um, a lot of families reported paying out of pockets for some therapies or being really thankful that they had insurance that could cover a lot of the therapies that their kid required. And those are two things that not all families are able to do. Um, additionally, when you have a kid that has a lot of different appointments or you have to you know, work a lot with the school administration, that does usually require taking time off of work and not all families are able to do that. Um, and so that can really help kind of exacerbate some of these inequalities that we see. And then finally, I think as I showed on the first slide, a vast majority of the people that we interviewed were women. And that was usually because these people reported being the primary care provider for the kid and also kind of the primary advocate. And this was true in both like heterosexual um, typical relationships, as well as in several situations where we interviewed single mothers. And if it's really hard to do all of these things when you have a loving and caring partner, it's compoundingly difficult to do all of these things when you're really doing them by yourself and don't have somebody to help carry the burden of other children or of kind of all the different things. And so this is another reason why we think it's really important to kind of draw attention to this kind of parent as advocate phenomenon because not only is it kind of harmful for all parents generally, as we showed on the last slide, but it actually really does exacerbate inequalities, which unfortunately the kids are the ones who really are on the receiving end and like receive the most harm when they aren't able to access services because of this kind of massive incomprehensible hurdle that their parent has to jump in order to be able to do so. And on that note, <laughs> um, there is a bright side, of course. Um, one of the things that we found that I mentioned a little bit earlier is that there is so much community and resilience in this patient population and among these parents, as you all know, because you are here taking part in a webinar put on by an organization that really helps foster a lot of this community and resilience. And a lot of parents that we talked to, they did say like, yes, this is exhausting and burdensome, but it's also incredibly fulfilling. And we even had some parents describe it as like finding their calling to you know, be an advocate for their child and be an advocate for this community more generally. And ultimately parents and families are building a better future through kind of the day-to-day -day things that they do for their own kid. So, you know, all of those providers that you end up having to educate are now providers that know more and are probably able to do better with the next kid they see. And through, you know, building communities, as I just mentioned, and also through participating in research like this, where we can kind of bring light to this issue amongst pediatricians who may not otherwise hear about it. These are all ways that we saw kind of just through this study that the parents and families are working on a better future, even though there is a big advocacy burden happening right now. Um, so all in all, even though it's a little bit of a depressing um, presentation to talk about kind of all of these incredible lifts that parents are doing, um, they're lifts towards a good future. And I kind of wanted to make sure that we ended on that because otherwise it can seem like kind of a bummer. And that's definitely not what we found in these interviews. We found that so many people were passionate and energetic and excited. And so that's definitely kind of the main takeaway here. Um, I wanted to leave a lot of time for questions, but I also definitely had to thank um, Kirsten and Kirsten Riggin and Megan Elise. They're the two other authors on the study and they were both absolutely invaluable. Um, you may have seen Dr. Elise on the right. I think she's been to a couple of different, um, couple of different meetings and has just kind of been around for a while and is doing more studies now. Um, so she's awesome and Kirsten's also really wonderful. Um, and other than that, again, I wanna thank you guys so much for participating in this study in the first place, um, as well as allowing me to share some of these results. And um, I am open to any questions. And I also threw my email address on there if you wanna ask a question um, another time, <laughs> that's totally fine. So I think 
you can go ahead and put questions in the Q&A and Rick and Carol will figure that out. <laughs> Yeah, we're happy. We're happy to do that. Or if somebody wants to um, do the thing where they raise their hand, we can unmute you if you want to make a comment. Yeah, um, I'd also love to hear um, comments on if this resonates with you, or if you know you have kind of experience that is outside of what we're reporting here, anything like that. We'd love to just open up this conversation. Or if you participated in the study and you want to say, hey, that was me. Um, yeah, definitely. I'd love to give you a shout out because that's just so important and we're so grateful. Okay, we have a couple questions going on. Um, the first question is from Caroline and she said, were there any suggestions on how to deal with burnout? Um, I wouldn't. So one of the kind of tricky things about qualitative research generally is that we can't necessarily like extrapolate too much. Um, and so I don't know that I can say like there was one overarching suggestion aside from what I mentioned, which was kind of building community and connecting with other parents. That seemed to be kind of far and large the biggest thing that uh, families said was really, really helpful. And a lot of that came from kind of the practical aspect of it of like, yeah, my son did this and here's what we did to fix it. And like, oh my gosh, that's so helpful. But also just kind of the sense of shared community and oh, that makes so much sense. And, you know, really that kind of support network aspect, it really seemed to be one of the biggest things. Um, other than that, I mean, I think a lot of people did say that you know, having like a good community locally was really important. Um, so people who had sisters and family and friends who were around and kind of helped share some of the kind of practical burden seemed to help a lot. But yeah, I hope that helped answer a little bit of your question. Okay, thank you. Um, another uh, comment was, let me find this. Um, what do you suggest to parents who are really tired of hearing, you're just looking for things, right? They, they kind of dismiss that dismissive, like we're looking for trouble or something. Do you have any um, suggestions? What can they can say to their healthcare providers? Um, I think that it's really difficult because at the end of the day, probably almost assuredly, you know, everybody in that room wants the best for the kid. Um, and it sometimes is really difficult when it feels like you're saying something and your provider is saying something and they're not meshing. Um, so I think kind of one of the most important things, and it's actually something that I have talked with providers about as well, is remembering that, you know, no one's there to fight. No one's there to um, just try to be, you know, obstinate or hard to work with. And I think that that is kind of the most important thing to keep in mind. Um, one thing that we saw is a, a lot of times if you're having providers that you feel like aren't listening or are kind of, I don't wanna say ignoring, cause I, I hope, I really think that most providers don't ignore, but you know, who knows? But I think that if, if it can feel like that, then maybe it's a good time to like bring in another party or to really kind of step back from the conversation and express at least that sentiment to the provider saying that, you know, I really think that I'm not being heard and like, here's why. And hopefully that the person on the receiving end of that conversation is willing to engage with that. And I guess if you find that they're not, then that's maybe a good sign that you're not with somebody who's there hearing you and understanding you. But I think in a lot of, in most cases you do have you know, a, a caring and compassionate person on the other side of that clinical table who wants to help you. And so keeping that in mind and like bringing it back and kind of sharing frustrations as well as, you know, your concerns are, is a, at least a good approach. Thank you. Yes, I have a, a couple of comments that people are talking about. One is just a thank you for your presentation. And uh, Nicole says being, you know, being the parent who's being dismissed, they haven't, you know, feels like the doctor thinks she's neurotic. It's just frustrating. Mm -hmm. And it's also hard as a parent, you have enough to deal with and you're burnt out and it's really hard to have to fight for services you need. Um, 
Another comment is from Janice. She found her son's counselor been a tremendous help in facilitating the coordination. Hmm. So of the healthcare professional school system. So, so that's um, one peer-to-peer uh, -peer suggestion. It turns out it helps a lot. And Katie asked, what is AXIS doing, right? To help share this information with medical genetic counseling education. So Katie, I'm really glad you asked us that. Uh, one thing, the reason we have these webinars and we love having them and having Jordan present her own research and sharing the research papers with our families, um, we, we suggest you do that. Take that paper, print it out, take it to your healthcare providers. It's peer reviewed scientific research. We think that gives it a lot of credibility. Our webinars are also recorded. Um, sending someone, you know, the share button off of there, sometimes that's helpful. We're hearing from physicians a lot. They're also exhausted and burned out. So when they can sometimes watch a video, except for reading another paper after a 12 hour day, that makes it a little bit easier for them. We are also uh, delving into the world of continuing medical education. We have a course that's coming out on Kleinfelder and adults. And now that we've figured out our system, we hope to be doing a lot more to that, figuring it's a win-win, getting the scientific information gathered together with our experts in the ACRC and giving that to um, physicians. And we're doing short 30 minute segments because we feel that's what works best for them and providing that to them free of charge. So we've done that through the support people give us and through a grant. Uh, if you have any other suggestions, we also attend scientific conferences and exhibit um, and it's all of you. And, and I'm a parent too. And I share that frustration of, hey doc, you're getting paid. I'm not, <laughs> why don't you know this? And I'm, I kind of look forward to the day there was some computer program that they could like type in and have the, you know, things pop up and not just be their personal experience, especially um, when it's something um, a little rare. Mm -hmm. I want to I would share this comment because this is from um, Michelle Kilo. I hope I say your name right. She said, as a practicing developmental pediatrician for 30 years, I applied your research, Jordan. And there is so much need for pediatric subspecialists to further education of general pediatricians to recognize early signs of developmental differences and to work as partners rather than just referring to the experts. Long way to go, but getting there. So proud of you, Jordan. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Kylo. <laughs> so I had to hear that. Actually, when I was a senior in high school, she allowed me to shadow with her and some other people in developmental and behavioral pediatrics. So that was a while ago, but it was really, you know, impossible for me and where I kind of first started seeing these types of interactions play out in the clinic. So uh, I appreciate that. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yep. And Janice says a thank you very much for the webinar. And uh, Nicole talks about the sociological impact on um, parents of SBA. If someone tries to me access not that research. So this is really refreshing. And I think especially for in the access community, quite often what happens is the even, even the more common things like Kleinfelter seems to get a lot of the oxygen in the room and those with less rare conditions, even though trisomy X, uh, XYY is, you know, what about one in a thousand, but certainly the parents who are like XXYY or triple XY, you know, they, they're really looking for answers. And so it's wonderful that you included them in this research. And that is also something AXIS advocates for. Whenever we hear of a study of someone doing a Kleinfelter study, for example, we certainly ask them include all the variations. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe you can comment on that. I mean, is there a reason people don't? Is it just harder to get a big enough cohort? But you certainly did it with a broader range. Yeah, I think one of the reasons that we're really able to do it is because a lot of the kind of conclusions that we're drawing, we are trying to draw that um, kind of overarch really the whole population of patients that we were interviewing. And we did actually, you'll notice, I can see if I can, well, here we go. Uh, you'll notice that we didn't include XO, which is I think typically referred to as Turner syndrome. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons is because, I think as you mentioned, it, it gets a lot of attention. And because it gets a lot of attention, it actually makes kind of the social experience of living with and parenting and navigating what it means, you know, in the real world to have Turner syndrome, super different from what it means to have trisomy X or Kleinfelters or one of these others. And Kleinfelters is kind of getting a little more popular, so it's kind of edging out that way as well. Um, but with our research, because even though, you know, medically and, you know, certainly genetically, um, these are different conditions, socially, the way that families tend to, you know, interact with 
the world around them and the medical system and the social services system tend to be really similar. And so that's why we're able to include them all under one umbrella. Um, but one of the things we did find is that, you know, the rare the conditions, so once you're looking at those tetrasomies and I don't even know what five somies is, but I think there are a couple, um, it starts getting harder. And part of that's because they are significantly rarer. And part of that's because a lot of times the phenotypes are a little bit more complicated. Um, and I think scientifically it's a little bit hard because one of the, you know, as many of you know, one of the kind of symptoms of one of these genetic differences is that you'll have hormone differences or kind of developmental and behavioral differences. And these are typically different for the different SCAs, even though, you know, the parents may have like really similar experiences and the kids may have really similar like social experiences and, you know, through adulthood, et cetera. Um, the kind of medical basis of it is often different. And so I think that's really kind of an interesting and unique thing about, you know, being patients and patient advocacies and that as like a social identity versus as, you know, a medical and clinical thing where they can be, you know, only vaguely related medically and clinically because they're, you know, sex chromosome haploidies, but other than that, fairly different, but still really bring together this deep bond because of how different the kind of social interactions are. So yeah, I hope that helped answer a little bit of your question why it's sometimes feels like certain parts are being missed out, but it, it's a little tricky. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, another comment is said, I love how you work highlights the importance of parents being beneficial and crucial to the healthcare team. Thank you for your presentation and your passion. Thank you. No, just thank you so much for this. And I thank everyone who attended. Uh, we'll be sending out the recording to everyone who registered. We'll also post it on our YouTube channel. And Jordan, we wish you the best in your studies. Hopefully uh, someday you'll be a member of our ACRC and you'll be presenting at our conferences. I would love to. Yeah, it'll be probably a few years, but that would be really wonderful. And I really hope to keep in touch with you guys. If you have any questions or just want to talk, please definitely send me an email. I would love to. And, and thank Oh, we're looking forward to it. And thank you to everyone who's a part of the Access community. Uh, you know, we understand how stressful and, and all of this is. We're in here for the long haul and we are here to support each other. So thank you all and have a wonderful evening. Good night, everybody. Bye.